hover in ground effect mm -hmm. on the surface of the water and herd the tuna with the helicopter. Two F-22s getting ready to shoot me down in like two seconds. And I hop in the water and I gotta swim and I get as close as I possibly can to this whale shark. I was walking in my dad's Ooh. footsteps, going through NAM. Yeah. Like, I a test flight when everything was done. They're like, make sure you call ATC. I was like, what the dude with that walkie <laughs> What's up, people? I'm back with Phil. Why are we back this time? We've got some epic stories. We're gonna talk about sailing the seas. Yes, the seven seas. I did not know that you were uh, a bit of a sailor too. A bit, a small bit, but I do like the ocean. My biggest story relates to taking a three-masted clipper ship, which is a replica of the Cuddy Sark, mm -hmm. which is on the bottle of scotch, yes, from a mountain, the port in the North Sea, in the Netherlands by Amsterdam, through the English Channel, Bay of Biscay, Atlantic Ocean, out of Portugal. Oh. Which wasn't that long, but it was epic. I got 13 months at sea. That's a lot longer. Straight. You've got a lot of stories. And you were doing some crazy badass stuff that I didn't know existed. So, uh, what got me out to the high seas, as uh, my Filipino mechanic would call it in his limited English. He'd be like, bro, we're going on the high seas. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> we're going on the ocean, I get it. Uh -huh. But um, there are two typical ways to get hours as a young pilot to become employable in a, what you would consider a tier two or tier three job. Yes. Okay. On your way up to your tier one career job. In a helicopter. In a helicopter. Okay. Not an airplane. Mm -hmm. And most commonly is you become a CFI, certified flight instructor, and you work for the school that trained you, train the trainers, that kind of thing. I didn't really have any interest in that. I don't, and it sounds kind of bad because I was really good at it in the army mm -hmm. as a non-commissioned officer training soldiers, but I just, I didn't want to become a certified flight instructor. Yeah. I want to get out there and work. I want yeah. to get out there and make money and prove myself, you know, earn my stripes as a, as a pilot. And there is a, there is a way to do that. And that's called the tuna boats. So they were at the time, two major companies. One was, um, an American based company out of Guam. And okay. The other one was an Australian based company, but they operated out of Honiara and the Solomon Islands in Ponape. Whoa. Micronesia. They typically hire anybody. And me as like having 200 hours, like how, I'm totally how? dangerous as a pilot. 200 hours in a helicopter. Uh-huh. Uh, so they're like, well, we'll take it. Come on out. How so, do you get connected with that? I didn't even know this existed. So I didn't either. Okay. Going to a, uh, some pilots are gonna nail me for this. I went to a pilot farm. <laughs> A pilot farm. I do a good job of making some pilots mad on my channel. I would argue it was the best. And it still is. It's just the the VA. Mm -hmm. It's a whole political mess. Fair enough. We won't get into it. But lots of resources come out of that because we had at the at our think at our Zenith forty two <laughs> aircraft. Oh wow. So a pretty big flight school. All rotorcraft? Uh that and we had some twin engines. Oh I'll be darn. Uh fixed wing. So it's, it doesn't take that much resources and mostly everyone being, uh, if you want to be a pilot, mm -hmm. you got to kind of be a little bit of a go-getter because it's not an easy industry to get into. Yes. So of course they're going to try to, uh, exploit every avenue to get hours. That's, that's all that matters. Yeah, that's it's get hours so you can be employed. It's kind of nuts, but yeah. So everyone figured out the tuna boat thing. Everyone figured it out. Everyone figured it out. And it was just like, okay, you're going to stay here, bust your butt and be a CFI at the company for X amount of years mm -hmm. until you accrue the hours and skills to be employable in whatever field you want to go in. Or you, which can, is, or you can go to the tuna boats for a year, get a bunch of hours real quick and then enter that tier two, maybe even tier one job early. Okay. So that is all very piloty and structured and boring. What the hell did you do on a tuna boat with a helicopter? So <clears throat> it's a 250 foot first signer. I think we'll get some pictures of it. Going. Okay. 
It's actually the same length as the sailing ship I was on. It's a big it's, boat. It's a big boat, yeah. And on top of the bridge, there is a helideck. Oh, really? Is and the bridge in the back or is it kind of in the middle? It's up in the front. It's near, it's it? more towards the uh, bow. Okay. And uh, the helicopter was there, obviously. Mm -hmm. I would take off and go scout for tuna with one of the uh, ship's officers. And you can spot tuna from a helicopter from miles away. What altitude were you at? Uh, typically, now every captain is different. My captain wanted me at 1,000 feet. Okay. Uh, AGL or above ground level, mm -hmm. which is kind of high, mm -hmm. but it works to spot tuna. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised. We were able to spot tuna for 20 miles with the naked eye. Whoa. Because when they, uh, when they school at the surface, when they feed on bait fish, mm -hmm. it, it, it's like a football field of foam. Wow. So imagine strange. like this giant, like, you just see a foamy wave. spot in the ocean that's just several acres mm -hmm. in size. And it's like, yeah, that's tuna. Wow. You can follow whales and dolphins and other marine life. And birds was another one. If they had a big flock of birds on the radar, they launched a helicopter to go check it out. And chances are it's typically tuna there. Oh, really? Birds. Yeah. They're all going to feed off these um, uh, base level organisms, whether right. it be krill or bait Those fish. Those are like diving birds. Yes. Going into the middle where the tuna are herding all. Exactly. Yeah, it just brings all the wildlife into one spot. So, kind of easy to spot. They never show a helicopter on National Geographic. They don't. I don't know. We've talked about having like our own like wild tuna <laughs> South Pacific. That would have been fun. Uh, we would have gotten shut down. You're like a tuna cowboy. I was a tuna cowboy. So, we go scout for the tuna and then the boat would do a, um, a what we call a setting. But mm -hmm. it would drop the net. And it drops it in a circular motion around the school. These are big schools. Oh, and the yeah. net's like two miles long. Wow. So they draw a circle with the net around and then they clench the net in. Mm -hmm. Now, during the portion where they do the setting and then start reeling it in, there are weak points in the net. Hmm. So I take the helicopter and land on the surface, or not, excuse me, hover in ground effect mm -hmm. on the surface of the water and heard the tuna with the helicopter, the uh, main rotor blade uh, frequency would translate through the water, <laughs> scare the hell out of the fish, and you could drive them with the helicopter into the center. Whoa. So yeah, kind of like a, I've never heard that, it's actually kind of clever, tuna what? cowboy. Tuna cowboy. Tuna cowboy. That's what you're doing. So we do that, and um, every, when, when the bolt was full, or the limit was 45 days, so either or came first, we would go to the nearest, um, uh, Pacific country, Islander country, where there would be a carrier ship and we would offload the tuna from, from our boat to the carrier ship and that would go to the uh, processing plant. Mm -hmm. And um, I worked on a South Korean boat, so that, would, that, that boat would go to South Korea. Yes. Man, 13 months doing this. So like every months. day scouting tuna or what was it like? It, that's pretty much what it was. And because uh, I was the only person on the boat that spoke English. I was on a South Korean boat that had all South Korean officers. Yes. The boatmen or workmen were uh, almost always um, uh, Micronesian. Mm -hmm. There were some Vietnamese and some Filipino and some even some Taiwanese sprinkled in there. So there's an Asian multicultural boat under yes. a South Korean flag vessel with South Korean officers. <laughs> so what they would do is I would just kind of basically wake up on my own leisure or wake up to the sound of the captain on the intercom system saying pilot helicopter standby pilot helicopter standby put my life vest on uh, -huh. uh ranger panties be military guys that's all i wore barefoot <laughs> ranger panties and a uh, inflatable life preserver no shirt <laughs> run up to the helideck get the aircraft going and then take off <laughs> on demand 24 7 no internet no phones no nothing Fascinating. Okay, that was interesting because you said that was a time in your life that you felt the smartest because you did the most reading. Yes, I was, uh, I guess, a little smart. I, uh, I heard that there, there were rumors when all the young pilots were talking about going on the tuna boats. It's like, there is nothing out there for entertainment. So, you know, be ready. Most guys load up a laptop mm -hmm. with a bunch of movies and stuff like that, pirating and mm -hmm. stuff like that. I, I would never do that. But uh, funny story, uh, my laptop got destroyed the first week I was there. Hmm. Uh, so there's no internet or any connection though, was there? But I had a hard drive I could watch. Oh, time. I got you, okay. But I brought a lot of books too. And yeah. I had my iPad and I had a bunch of books downloaded too. So I, I just, all I did was read, read. And I read a lot of different books, all kinds of different subjects. Got into philosophy a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, that kind of led to some meditating 
And I, I really felt like I was at a apex as far as me. Mm -hmm. I would, when I would go meditate up on top of the helideck right next to the helicopter, because you're at the, almost the highest flat spot in the boat. Yes. You can see the ocean and it's just, seeing a sunset in the mountains in Utah or here on the grasslands mm -hmm. of Ohio. But when you're out in the, uh, no. the equatorial Pacific, seeing sunrises and sunsets, they're just a whole nother animal. It's almost like being on a different planet and you really just get into the zone and you can really work on yourself and preach what you read, so to speak. Hmm. So that was a very interesting aspect. But the cool thing was bouncing around from third world, third world um, welfare country hmm. to different ones. That's where oh, we discharge yeah. the tuna. So we, we'd fill up the boat, we go to this, these, these random countries out in the middle of nowhere. You have to like barter, what do you think? Yes. So on Tarawa, mm -hmm. which uh, is a historical World War II site, um, it is a, it's, a, it's a third world uh, welfare country. Mm -hmm. It's a very small island. You can walk from one end of the country to the other in less than a day. Hmm. And probably an afternoon. Mm -hmm. It's not that big. Um, needless to say, uh, people there are in great need of basic things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so was I. <laughs> because there's no such thing as ATMs or banks working out in those kind of uh -huh. countries where like two buildings in the entire country have electricity and it sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. There's a cell tower that you have to buy SIM cards for, but of course, having Apple devices that were bought in the United States, the SIM cards don't work, so I have to buy the SIM card adapter and an X-Acto blade and cut the SIM card out of the micro SD, put it in my main. It you have to do all this kind of crazy <laughs> stuff, and it's just like, man, I don't want to deal with this. <laughs> so word gets out, and they're like, you know what? If you take a tuna from the boat, you can pretty much get whatever you want in town. So luckily, uh, being kind of like a in, an interesting pilot, so Is to that speak, a on the boat. In your pants or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the um, the first officer let me get away with the yellowfin tuna, a, oh. a decent sized one. And I took that on the uh, customs boat to shore. Mm -hmm. And there's a uh, a bar. It's just like out of the scene of Tatooine. Like there's just a whole different oh, yeah. mix of people in there uh, on Tarawa, right at the docks. And it, it, there's no AC. Everyone just chain smokes. And they only had Jim Beam there, and they had lots of it. <laughs> so you go into this bar, everyone's pretty much wasted, middle of the day, you're in a third world country, but no one's got anything better else to do. Right. And I have this yellow fin, and everyone is looking at me. I'm like, all right, should I be worried? <laughs> I'm gonna keep an eye out for a machete. Uh-huh. You know, I had a Rolex on at the time. <laughs> God. Uh, so that was a dumb idea. I should've known better, I should've left it on the boat, but I had that, and I'm like, oh great, I'm an awesome target. People start coming up to me like, what do you want for the tuna? And I'm like, I don't- Yeah, that Rolex is probably not gonna do that much good there. No, I don't, I don't need money. I need internet. So I would trade fish. Fascinating, that's fascinating, isn't for it? For a, uh, a device that I could uh, log on the internet, get on, uh, at the time, Facebook Messenger and tell my family I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> and in some cases I could trade a fish for a scooter to get about the island. You are literally like an alien to them. Yes. Especially with the tattoos, the tats, it, for, I mean, you can see my hands, but I, I'm like head to toe covered. And when you're out in the equatorial Pacific, uh -huh. you're, you're like half naked the whole time. So right. it's unbelievably hot there. Yeah, not like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it's, it's weird. You, you go from being in the United States where you swipe things with plastic and mm -hmm. you get it, to a place where you could barter a yellowfin tuna and basically get what you need, not what you want, because you're never going to get what you want on those islands because mm -hmm. they're very, like I said, third world countries. Right. But you can survive just by bartering, which was really cool. I've never experienced that in my life. I'm like, when it's actually happening, I'm like, this is what happened like 50 years ago, 100 years ago. This is super old school. And I was, it's an interesting experience I will never forget. Fascinating. Because it was cool. I got to get on Facebook to talk to my family while someone got to eat tuna. <laughs> it's, it's, it was weird. That's also such a fant fantastically interesting dichotomy, just the nature of bartering a fish for tuna on an island so that you, a weird white alien with art all over your body, can 
communicate via electricity to some or random get a people. Scooter or a moped or you know whatever I wanted. So when you were on that ship, you had some amazing experiences uh, beyond just meditating and the sunrise and sunset with like marine life. Oh yes, so uh, this this probably shouldn't get me in trouble, but um, when you set a a net that's two miles wide mm -hmm. in diameter, or excuse me, not wide, uh, two miles in diameter, and so they got away, right? The things we're talking about. Yes, okay. they are. Uh, you catch things other than tuna, right? Uh, you catch whales, uh, whale sharks, turtles, uh, porpoises, dolphins, all kinds of things. Now these nets are designed, uh, they have all kinds of these whale holes or pilot holes so that the sea life can escape. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, sometimes we get in a helicopter and try to drive them out. Mm -hmm. And it, it worked every single time. Really? Excuse me. But this one time we had a, uh, a whale shark and her calf. Wow. And for whatever reason, it just... it couldn't get out the hole. Mm -hmm. And the net kept coming in closer and closer. Mm -hmm. And I asked the captain. You don't, you don't want any part of that. It's not no, like you're, you guys you're talking like hundreds of thousands care. of dollars of fines and stuff like no, that. It's not. But that that's, that's all South Korea's problem. That's not my problem. Right. What I got in front of me is a whale shark in a net. And I, there's still plenty of room. The, at this point when I went. You've got an aquatic missile with a mine. Yes. So I asked the captain, I said, uh, and you gotta, there's a whole language of English out there. It's called Korean English. Mm -hmm. You gotta learn that. Mm -hmm. So I say, uh, I go to the captain and I say, Captain, pilot me, uh, swimmy setting. And captain, he looks at me and he's like, this is crazy, stupid. Wait, American. I'm just hitting this again. You're going in the net with the whale shark and the tuna, all of which are freaking out. Yes. Okay. So uh, my mechanic, Bob, uh, a Filipino, uh -huh. um, gave me his snorkel. I had flippers. <laughs> and I hop in the water and I go to swim and I get as close as I possibly can to this whale shark and her calf in the setting with a bunch of skin Not as a swim, I think you're smart enough. It was so cool. And it, they're really docile animals. But uh, what my mechanic told me, he's like, if, if he's like, bro, if she show you tail, swim, swim away. Mm -hmm. And Ooh. it did, and that's when I got out of the net. I got out of the setting. I respected the animal. <clears throat> uh, but uh, yeah, I got pretty close. I have to say I got within, what I would say, hand grenade range. About 30 <laughs> yards <laughs> yeah. to a whale shark and, and its calf. And I'm underwater, and I got the goggles, and I'm snorkeling the flippers, and it's just like everything. This is so cool. Wow. People pay absurd amounts of money to go jump in a shark tank. Right. Or a shark cage or whatever those things are. You know, go do all this stuff. Okay. And I'm getting paid, like, really terrible because I'm a low-hour pilot and they get away with that. <laughs> they know I'm more concerned about hours than money. How did, they, how did they get out eventually? How did that work out that day? <clears throat> uh, the calf, this is oddly enough, the calf got out, but the mother didn't. Hmm. So they had to cut the net. Ah, interesting. And it's like a $2 million net. Wow. Yeah. It was a big problem that day. The calf I was very upset. I bet. Did the calf hang around? Did you ever see him? <clears throat> yes, it, it stayed by the boat. The mother, so the they mother, got back together and did their thing. Uh, we, the mother was released, and I don't know the, their fates. Hmm. Well, but it was all in the same area. We can only hope. So how did fixing the net go? Oh, that was bad. We had to go to Ponape, <laughs> where they gave us, this is in Micronesia, another crazy little country. Um, a lot of interesting things went down in Ponape. I can only imagine. <clears throat> Psychedelics. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is uh, all right. Tell. So in Ponape, they have this thing called Sakao, and it's a plant, right? Okay. And um, are you sure you want to say this? I don't care. Are you sure about that? It's interesting. Okay. And it's relevant. See, if you ever go to Ponape, Ponape and someone, you see people drinking this, what looks like dirt water, you're like, oh, they're tripping. Because that's, that's what they're doing. So, Sakao is uh, it's this plant that has psychedelic properties. Okay. And uh, the shaman collect up the roots of the Sakao and they perform the ceremony called pounding the Sakao. And they just take clubs with these dirty... Just beat the crap out of the roots? Just beat the crap out of the roots, get the, the juice out. Uh-huh. And then you drink it, but it's just like muddy. It looks like mud water. Yes. And it tastes like chalky, waxy, disgusting mud water. And you drink, they, they serve in these like wine bottle type mm -hmm. deals. If you can get through that, it, it's pretty gnarly. The bottle? Or is it like a glass or what's the serve? No, you just, I just got the bottle. Uh -huh. I paid the guy the, the 10 
Australian dollars. So I got the bottle and I, I was with one of my one of my buddies, one of my American buddies, and uh, it made it for a very interesting night. I can only imagine. And, and mosquitoes became very lively. <clears throat> Lights became very lively. It was uh -huh. a real experience. I really kind of indulge myself in their culture. <laughs> and this is like normal. There's people walking up and down the streets of Ponape just pounding this account, just drinking it. <laughs> I'm like, I am walking around a bunch of people tripping right now. <laughs> Fascinating. It was really weird. And then getting into the country was interesting. Okay. It's my first time flying. So we, so the boat went into the dock, right? Okay. Where they were going to do the net repairs. So it's like, all right, I got to get, we had a, a satellite company there. Okay. So we had a satellite hangar, I'm sorry. Uh-huh. So they wanted me to fly the helicopter into the country so we can do some maintenance on it. We had to replace the fuel cells and a couple of parts timed out. Uh-huh. We're, yeah, when you're at the tuna boats working for a non-US company, uh, maintenance is really scary. I'll get into that in a little bit. <laughs> um, but I'm like, okay. But I have like, whatever. I have like 200, at that point I probably had like 400 hours. Uh-huh. You know, very limited control airspace time. Like, I don't, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> They're like, yeah, just fly into the country. It's not a big deal. And I'm thinking like, if I were to do that in the United States, wait, what? Like wait. I have like two F-22s getting ready to shoot me down in like two seconds. Wait, just fly into what kind? Wait, what do you mean? I'll fly into Ponape. So oh. I parked, we parked in their, uh, their boat. I don't know how to explain it. Like maritime people would know this. Yeah. There's like parking for boats at the harbor. Right, boat, yeah. But I still have to take off from the helideck enter Ponape airspace and then land at their airport. And from there, we have a trailer. I land on the trailer and then we, we drive the helicopter back to this satellite mm -hmm. hangar mm -hmm. we have. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm like kind of bad at telling stories. Um, <coughs> anyway, so uh, I got off the boat and from the, from the harbor, uh, the truck with the trailer met me. We went to the airport and I was like, hey man, I gotta get this aircraft here at this airport. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a flight plan or anything like that. And he's like, oh, no, no problem. <laughs> So he comes back with a piece of paper and it looks like it's been copied several thousand times because it's all like, there's no, uh -huh. uh, it's not symmetrical. Like put your name here and it's like at a 90 degree angle and the paper is like, you know, it's typical eight by 10. I was uh -huh. like, I think I can get this. So I put my name down, the tail number, name, tail number, country of origin. And that was pretty much it. And he's like, turn on this frequency. And he has a walkie talking in his hand and he's like, I'm the tower now. So I'm like, great, I got a guy on the ground with a walkie talkie and he's the now he's ATC. ATC controller, yeah. So I'm like, all right, go back to the boat. <laughs> they leave the trailer and everything. What was this together. guy's name, do you remember? I don't know. <laughs> it was probably the Sakal. Okay. He got me going. <laughs> so I take off on the helicopter from the, from the hell boat and I'm trying my best to be like the perfect pilot, like uh -huh. making all Nobody these notices radios. or cares. No one cares. No one cares. cares. The guy had his radio clipped on. I could see him when I was coming in the lane. He had it clipped on his side and he was smoking a cigarette. <laughs> just looking at me like, what's this guy doing? <laughs> like I'm coming down the runway, making my perfect calls, just freaking out being a young pilot. And he's just like, Truck's there. <laughs> I land on the truck, land on the flatbed of a truck, and I'm not, I'm, I'm landing a helicopter on like <clears throat> what you would expect to see in a third world country as far as a truck and trailer. Okay, yeah. So we almost bottom everything out, and we drive this truck and trailer through the jungle, Equatorial Pacific, Ponape. With your helicopter? <clears throat> With the helicopter. The roads, I'm thinking, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Where the insane. hell are you going? We went to our hangar, we have a satellite hangar there, and that's where they do all the maintenance and everything. In the jungle? In the jungle. What? And then it was cool, it was flying in the jungle. I felt like I was in, I was walking in my dad's Ooh. footsteps, going through Nam. Yeah. Like, they were doing a test flight when everything was done. They were like, make sure you call ATC. I was like, what the dude with that walkie <laughs> I'm not calling him, get the helicopter, let's go. So we take off, and we are just tearing ass all over the jungle, uh -huh. top level. That's what we do in, yes. the, in this rotor world. We don't like high altitudes. Yeah, no, no, I like this. It's just so much fun. And then everything is good, good. Everything gets sorted out with the net, get on the boat, and we go out for the next unforeseen time with Man. just no communication with the world, no one to really talk to. But it's great because <clears throat> when you're in an environment where no one speaks your language, you end up understanding people and they understand you in a very short period of time. Oh, fascinating. Yes. You kinda, well, in what way do you mean understand? <laughs> body language. Uh-huh. And then, as simple as, uh, so the, the Korean offers I don't think we do body language very well in America anymore. <sighs> no, we don't. Our actors don't do it at all, hardly. 
No. They just need to look pretty and say they want it. Honestly, you know who deals with good body language? Who? Boomers. They come from that era. Do they? They do good body language. At least the boomers I've dealt with. Okay. Um, but you get on the boat and uh, they'll just sit there and point at a picture and say it 10 times in a row. And it's like, okay, that's what that word means. Okay. And it's just fun. I mean, you, you gotta, you're out at sea, you got nothing to do, no internet, nothing. So you just come together as mm-hmm. men. Men are really good at doing that. Mm-hmm. And just have good camaraderie. And you'll, I'll sit across from uh, the Korean, the South Korean officers, they were real young kids. Yes. And they, they really like me because yeah. I'm like everything that they would see in oh, the music Oh, you can still video. have humor and jokes, just yes. body language. from South Korea. So they thought I was just like this weird, cool, typical American. <laughs> so they wanted to hang out and I want to hang out because the other we got to keep sane on this boat right. when we're out at sea for weeks on time. And they would sit there and just tell me in South Korean this entire story. I have no idea what they're talking about, but it made sense because I could tell it was a happy story. Right. But it had, it had like a funny ending or a sad ending. And yeah. We came together on it. It was, it was a trip. I like that. And then um, all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, I, sw- I flew with dolphins. Okay. So flew dolphins. Home. Flew with dolphins. Flew with dolphins. What does that mean? So dolphins are a good indicator that tuna is going to be in the area because okay. they have the same uh, source of food. Oh, uh, okay. So if you see a school of dolphins, chances are they might be going to mm-hmm. a source of food. But in the meantime, while they're going to their source of food, you can fly over the water. I would typically fly 10, 15 feet maybe above mm-hmm. the water and you fly with them. You kind of have to approach them steadily so you don't mm-hmm. want to scare them. Right. And then you get flying with them. And then you change directions and they'll change directions with you. That's a fascinating it thing. It was really kind of cool. I love watching how dolphins ride the compression waves on ships. And yes. Stuff. They're, they're, that was fun from the sailing ship because you climb out on the bowsprit way off the front and you get the most pitching up there. So you're standing on the big chains with the ropes while the waves are coming up to you like this. So you got a massive amount. Meanwhile, the dolphins are just ripping it up down here underneath like the woman of the ship on the bow. You know They're I mean? like hyper intelligent little kids. Yeah. Like they have that, that enthusiasm, that playfulness, but they're, they're extremely intelligent. They like do nothing but surf all day. Oh, they just live the greatest life. Did you see the one that um, came blazing out of the water to like body slam a, a yeah. guy on a, a oh, surfboard? Darling. It's yeah, all on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, that was, that, was, that was how I got hours, and the other cool thing about uh, when we get on the islands, you'd be lucky enough, because I was out there with a lot of my other flight school buddies, mm-hmm. so we get to the islands, I'd see my buddy I haven't seen in like months, and then we'd have a great time and party. Yes. Like, lots of good camaraderie. Man, uh, oh, Papua New Guinea. Okay. So we, we, uh, we discharged fish there, so we, we uh, discharged our catch onto a carrier boat there, mm-hmm. and I want to go on the islands. It was one of the only islands that had a Western Union. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I got. I told the captain, I was like, I got to go to the islands. The captain was giving me these weird vibes, like, uh, pilot, you stay boat, sleepy boat, hmm. like to stay on the boat, and not go off the island. I was like, oh, man, I, I really got to get a Western Union. I need some cash, you know, yada yada yada. <clears throat> and he was like, okay, pilot, you safe, no crazy. I'm like, okay, dude. Even my mechanic was like, I don't know, buddy. I don't think you should go to the island. Really. I'm like, all right, like I'm not a dumb. I know Papua New Guinea's known for like the headhunters and their crazy tribes and cannibalism and stuff. But really, it's, still, it's it's really real. It's really real. Boy, like we're talking like backwoods tribal stuff. Are we talking like civilized? It's crazy tribal mafia stuff. What is this? It's civilized, but these tribes come to town like during the day. Wow, it's like, it's almost like they're hunting ground. Oh, and you're like a prize trophy over I here. am a, I am that, you know. You are a white whale, sir. That 10 point buck yeah. that you've never seen. You know, that white man, American. Oh my God, they would love to cut my head off uh, and then eat my body. Fascinating. So when the customs boat came to pick me up, take me on the, on the shore, they're all packing FALs. Yeah. Rifles. And I'm like, all right, this is cool. I like fouls. I was like, hey man, can I play with it? You know, I was like, I know what I'm doing. They're like, no. I was like, all right, fine. (laughs) So the whole time I was on the island, I had to get a armed escort with these guys. Really? Yeah. Really? They're they're like, dude, like, what are you doing? Yeah. And there's just groups of military aged young males with machetes standing in the streets, just all focused on me. And these custom guys are, yeah, these custom guys are like, 
just trying to hurry up and usher me. I had to go to the farm. just walking around them, like out with a handle and they oh, got yeah, like, that's on normal there. Yeah. You're walking around the machete. Yeah. You ever been to Somalia? No. It's just like that there too. Fascinating. You gotta get outside the United States and see some really different things. I'm not gonna say weird, but different. Yeah. Um, so they're like, hurry up and trying to get me into these shops. And I had to go to this pharmacy. This pharmacy had this Western Union. And uh, I'm like crazy about taking a daily vitamin. I mean, mm -hmm. crazy about taking a daily vitamin for, from when I was a kid. So two birds, one stone. They got mm -hmm. the Western Union there and get some vitamins. So hurry up and trying to get me in the shop. And we got these two custom guys with their uh, FALs. It's a 762 battle rifle, Belgian, for those who don't know. Pretty, pretty awesome gun. And uh, they're just standing there, just neck and neck with me, making sure I make it out of there without getting decapitated and eaten. Wow. So that was experience of Ponape. And then at night when we were on the boat, they, uh, you have to padlock your door from the inside because people come on the boat and try to steal things. And they'll actually, they've killed people in the past coming on the boat, you know. Just looking like for that. whatever. Just looking for whatever. Yeah. So. Interesting time, but the most beautiful sunset, I'll give you a picture of it, mm -hmm. and I've ever witnessed in my life was, was, was at Punape. So it was, huh. it was an interesting uh, little situation. I hear in Hawaii, at the right time, a sunset, the moment the sun goes down, there's like a green flash, a green spark. Did you ever see any funky phenomenon like that? The only funky, no, nothing like that. The only funky phenomenon I've ever seen is what's called a halo mm -hmm. on the main rotor blade of a helicopter. Oh, St. Elmo's Fire? Yes. Interesting. Yes, you can get a little halo every now and then, and it, it, it's kind of cool. Yeah, that is cool. Well, crap, got anything else from that journey? Uh, what was it like getting back to the United States? Oh, so back to the United States, uh, I, I, okay, so, I, I don't care. Uh, I got out to, the starting point for my job was Haniera in the Solomon Islands. I had to buy a one-way ticket to Australia. That's how buying plane tickets in U.S. Customs and Regulations worked at that time, because you had to buy a return ticket. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get a return ticket from the Solomon Islands, so I bought a one-way ticket to Brisbane, Australia, mm -hmm. with a, you're allowed to stay in a country Wait, Why can't you get a return time. ticket if you got there? That's just how it works. That's just how it works. That's just how okay. it worked. So, um, during my, uh, transfer from Haniera, Solomon mm -hmm. Islands, to Brisbane, Australia, mm -hmm. I left the airport with my new boss, <clears throat> and within 15 days he put me on a boat out of the country so that I could not be traceable anymore with my passport in that country. So I essentially disappeared off the face of the earth. Just but because I went to sea. Just because I went to sea, international waters. But I came back with passport stamps because I got my passport stamped and I think my first stop was Tarawa. But I got a passport stamp in another country and that kind of like mitigated the process, kind of. I got lucky though when I came back in uh, and the customs agent at LAX, so I flew into LAX from um, Christmas Island in the South Pacific. Okay. Um, in Ranger panties and a stinky tank top that had holes in it. I can buy shoes in Fiji. You came though. flying in to LAX dressed like that. Yes. Just like on whatever plane. Just that's freaking great. It was terrible. I actually I left. Uh, so what did they, the customs guy say to you? So or girl. Whatever. <clears throat> it was a gentleman. He was a marine. Okay. And uh, how old? About my age at okay. the time, late twenties, early thirties. <laughs> and uh, he kind of gave me. He looked at my passport. He, and it's my like, passport. I had the same passport from when I was uh, stationed in Italy. Oh. So I have all this European stuff. And then uh, I have some Kuwait stuff on there too. Mm -hmm. I did some like contracting on the side when I first got out. We won't talk about that. Um, and then this random cluster of countries I don't add up from mm -hmm. the South Pacific. And he's like, <clears throat> what were you doing out there? And I was like, I told him, I was just like straight up. I was like, I'm flying helicopters off of tuna boats. <laughs> and I had, a, I had my hat on, actually this hat right here. Yes. And I had my, my Ranger tab and my combat infantryman's badge. So he, he could kind of see what's right. up. And he looked over it and he could tell that I was gonna be a huge hassle for him. <laughs> but luckily, we had like, we connected on a moment of like being vets and everything. Right. He's like, welcome home, man. It was really nice. Fair enough. And I was freaking out about it. Cause even my boss told me when, when I got my final uh, 
contract separation. He was like, you knew the dangers coming in to the job where you had to leave the airport and do all this and that and uh, basically break some walls to come here. And I said, I understand. That's the dude at the tuna boat, you mean? My, the boss, boss of the tuna boat, yeah. Okay. Tuna boat boss. He's like, you know the risk coming in here. So you can't put this back on us because you took the risk yourself. Kind of trying to like cover his own butt, but kind of giving me a heads up to be prepared to get into a little issue. I have a pain in the ass. Coming through uh, LAX. And uh, if that guy's watching, thank you. Uh, it just, <laughs> I'm not a bad guy. I just trying to get hours to pursue my dreams <laughs> in the most weird manner. But thank you, uh, I'm a good guy, just trying to do uh, you know good work to get the hours up. It's fun though, like that's what makes life interesting. When you can say, you know, things like that, it's fun, it's interesting. You know, your story reminds me of, uh, it's gonna sound cliche, but like Star Wars. Yeah, that's what it was like, it was yeah. old school. They're, you're, you're completely cut off from the Dude, rest the of the world. world can't deal with this. They don't even know how to process. It's like I was on a different planet. Oh yeah, multiple. It's so weird. And I'm, I'm not trying to like uh, exaggerate or anything. Like this no, genuinely you, you how don't it have was. to exaggerate that. No one speaks English. There's no, really no concept of, of money. You know, the, the predominant currency, of course the US box frame is supreme out there. But Australian USD, there's like, You'd be lucky to get on an island that has internet and the capabilities of Western Union. Mm -hmm. See, you've got to be creative. You've got to do things the old school way. <laughs> it's really weird. But it was it was so great. And uh, I'm just so happy that I got to experience that. Because it's fascinating. made me a great per a better person for it. Oh, for sure. Much more well-rounded, appreciative of what you got here. Yeah, yeah. And it was just fun to just do all that wild shit. Yes. Crazy stuff. You know, I remember a similar conversation. We'll, we'll need to end this, and I'm not even going to tell you my sailing stories after this. This this rains on its own episode. Oh, I got a lot, I got a lot more, but I can't say those on camera. It's okay. We'll talk them over apple juice sometime. Okay. <laughs> um, why are we calling it apple juice after telling that story? I don't know. I've broken several international laws. I'm also drinking scotch that Casey was so uh, <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice to bring over. Here. Thank you, sir. I bought it at Rite Aid. It wasn't. It has no interesting story. That's good. It's doing its job. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. So, uh, what was the wisdom takeaway from this experience? Any big, profound one? There's lots of little ones. It sounds. Yeah. I mean, I took a, I took several huge risks. Mm-hmm. And so I had a goal. Mm -hmm. And I you didn't have to do that. You could have been a CFI. I could have done been CFI, but why'd you do it? I wanted to do the hard way. Why? That's that's been my life since I was a little kid. Is I always get thrown in the pool to swim. That's yes. how I was raised, and that's what I know. That's what I'm programmed to do. And honestly, like if I'm gonna fly helicopters with mm -hmm. other people's lives under my charge, dude, put me through the ringer. I want to be the best I can be. Yeah, I hear that. You know, and it's it's always served. It served me well when I was a ranger, mm -hmm. and it's serving me now in my my current job, my current profession. And I just I don't want it easy, and it's more fun that way. You always find yourself in these weird situations that just don't make no sense, and you got to figure out a way to to make it work. <sighs> I put myself through hell not kind of knowing what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. I had an idea it's going to be a little rough. I didn't realize it was going to be as rough as it was mm -hmm. during times. But I also learned a lot about myself. And I think going off into the unknown, what I guarantee it'll make you a better person. You saw a lot of activity in your military career. Mm -hmm. And that was purposeful and with others and of its own challenges and difficulties across the board. Was this like another level or another facet of life challenges that you just had to scratch that itch? So yes. Like make a hole? Yes and no. In, in the way, it's, it's fundamentally the same things. Mm -hmm. It's challenge, it's adversity, it's grit, it's all these things that I've, that I've done in the military. It's just they're applied to different situations. Good point. So it's always the same thing. Just that tough, hard, old school life but just in a different setting with different people with a different goal. I like it. And it's, it's fun. I love it. Clearly got a little addicted to it. Still am <laughs> a little bit more calm now, but uh, yes, it's a good experience. Right. I wouldn't trade it for the world. It, it taught me a lot about myself. Well, thanks You're for never too story. old to learn about yourself. That's a very good point on that. I think we'll end it. Um, I think you guys like this. 
And if you thumbs down it, Phil will find you. <laughs> no, we don't care. We don't really care. Anyway, I hope you guys will like, comment, and subscribe. See you next time. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it.